Prof, uh, how have you been doing? Uh, very well, thanks. Um, I'm definitely more positive than Good. I've been for the last three years. <laughs> well, so, so first and foremost, I just want to get this out. I was just uh, did a talk at Oxford in the UK, and I visited yes. a lot of my old friends from, from my medical school days. And I just want to convey Sean Mortimer, John Rachman. Sean did, a, did his master's with you, and you have no idea what an incredible impact you have had on these folks. John Ruckman is right now the chief researcher of diabetes for Eli Lilly in the UK. And yeah. uh, EMT surgeon, but had a very tight stenosis um, at the age of 47. And yeah. with, a, with a CAC score of 80, and he blew it off. And I said to him, hey, Sean, you know what? Let's go and look at this because of your history, because your diet. And we invoked some of your information. And he went and convinced his cardiologist to go and have a look because he had a low CAC score, he's a little symptomatic, and they find a tight stenosis, stented him, and he's now 10 years later and doing great. So they both asked me to convey uh, Thank you. Uh, their, their thanks and their appreciation uh, to you as a mentor. So thank you very thanks. much. Obviously, from me as well, that's, that's true. <laughs> well, that makes it all worthwhile. So thank you very much for that. Good. Yeah. Uh, Prof, I know, I know we're going to be talking a lot about the book today, but I, if you don't mind, are there, there are a couple of other questions that I think would be very valuable for our audience, because I don't think you realize that you, you may do, but the respect and the admiration that you have in, in this entire field is just absolutely wonderful and juxtaposes completely, probably in, in similar quantity with the groups that oppose us. But, um, yeah. you know, science matters sometimes. I, yeah mind if I asked you a personal question you're, you're of course in. you can ask me anything you like I may not answer it but uh... no, that's fine and just tell me if you don't answer it but you're in your 70s right now you've yeah. got a, a very public history of type 2 diabetes but I know that you do not have like a lot of my patients a vulnerability to addictive behavior so how do you live your life in terms of your current diet and if I may ask medications and supplements that you take sure That'll be a pleasure. So I was so clearly addicted to the the ultra processed foods and sugar particularly. And as, as an athlete, you get around it because you go and run and you will take your drink. And of course, that's acceptable. I mean, it got so bad that when I would run 5Ks, we'd stop halfway and have a Coca-Cola and a sweetie. I mean, that's how but bad I'll, it was. I'll ask you a question. You, 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 you invoked the concept of addiction. Do you think that was truly you depending on the high you got from the sugar? Or do you think it was because of a misguided nutritional benefit at the time that sugars are great for athletes? No, I definitely think there was an addiction. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, but it's not an it's it's an addiction to sugar, but it's also an addiction to sweetness. And I'll I'll tell you why I think that, because look, this past week. We were asked to look at a product which is low in carbs, but has quite a high sweetness. And I haven't eaten sweet stuff for 12 years. And immediately, I just took one of these and I wanted to take more. So there's, I think there's an added addiction to the taste, the sweet taste, because I'd completely taken all the sweet taste out for 10 years. And, and there, it's so, but just having this bit of chocolate on a macadamia you think it was nothing, but it was a sweet taste. But it made me feel a bit ill. I must also add that I think that you you build you build a resistance to that sweet taste. So that there's there's more than just the sugar because this does this product doesn't contain sugar, but it take, contains something else, some sort of sweetener, and it's far too sweet. And so I'm also thinking there's an addiction to the sweetness, and and probably the mouth feel and everything else as well. Yeah, and I've labeled those, I call those products lookalikes. They look like something with sugar in them. And there is, as you've itemized, a both a psychologic and a physiologic attraction to them. Yeah. They, yeah. They call for a lot of our patients, a transitional phase. So you go from Coke to Diet Coke, but eventually the goal is to get off. It's a little yeah. bit like going from heroin to methadone to off. Uh, so it's a transition point, but you're absolutely right. The ideal is to eventually be in a world where you're not desiring that sweetness because the only value there is for the the headspace but it does play uh, physi physiologic games with you as well yeah so what is your what does your eating day look like in terms of not just the what you're eating but also your pattern yeah 
So I generally eat one meal a day. That's that's what I aim for, one cooked meal. So it could be breakfast or lunch or supper. And it'll if at breakfast, it's the traditional British meal of eggs and bacon and sausage and coffee. And, and that's about it. I might have some ham or if there's ham around or fish, those sorts of things. And the meal will be fish or steak. That, that'll that be lunch or dinner. So and there's very carnivore. little veg. You lean, Sorry? lean heavily toward carnivore? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's been a slow progress because I believed and I was still, I still believe that you needed vegetables to give you your nutrients. So that the people who advised me, the dietitians, they, they could say, okay, we understand that you're not going to eat grains, but you still need vegetables because you've got to get all these vitamins and so on. So it's definitely a carnivore. You know, the interesting thing is that I was raised as a carnivore. My mother, we, we I was raised in Zimbabwe and there wasn't processed foods. They didn't have such a thing. <laughs> and, and we got food directly from the farm. And, and she raised me on brains and kidneys and liver and eggs and bacon and meat. And that was, and fish. And she said, no, fish is very good for your brain. That's what she believed. But she came from a family that were meat exporters from Britain, so that that was the the drive. Interesting. So, I, and then of course I go into medical school, and I'm convinced that that's completely wrong. And so then I change and get sick thereafter, and well, that did and watch my running performance drop dramatically. But I couldn't understand what was going on, why it was happening, and in my thirties, and it should never have happened then. Mm -hmm. But I was clearly quite severely insulin resistant, and and pre-diabetic but of course i didn't understand it in those days right and and uh so first of all the from a brain perspective that developing brain and you know i'm i've got a particular interest with young kids yeah. you're on the best diet in my opinion and certainly from a science perspective to develop the best quality structural brain anatomically structural brain giving your brain those fats and all the minerals and vitamins and probably being raised in a degree of ketosis um, yeah. so that's that's the starting point and nobody can you can't get that back and yeah. uh, you can't regrow that. So you either start with that or not. And that's such an important point for uh, uh, moms and for young children is that starting point, you've got one shot at it. So that's a, that, and that set you set you up for the rest of your life. So that's a big deal. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Then I went to boarding school at the age of seven and we were allowed sweets once a week. You know, on a Wednesday afternoon, we, the tuck shop would open and we'd be given three pennies of sweets. And it was probably less than a handful. And that was a week's supply of sweets. Right. And when when it was holidays, my dad would take us for, for an ice cream once a week. And that was it. And so we, and we had very little exposure to also to fizzy drinks. And I can remember vividly I think I was probably about 12. The first party I went to where there was lots of sugar available. And I remember feeling sick after we eating all that sugar. And that that was vivid. I, can, I mean, when I drive past that house today, I still get that sickness again. <laughs> so what's interesting is that, that just like with alcohol and alcoholism, we become tolerant to that ill feeling if we do it. Yeah daily basis and a, a lot of the complaints we get are fatigue and I feel terrible and people don't know how terrible they feel because it's a status quo for them until yeah. they get rid of it and they realize how well they feel so what you're describing is a large part of people describe it oh it's cortisol or oh it's my adrenal fatigue it's just the abundance of sugar as you described as a one time that is now a pervasive thing so that's interesting so, so that was that. That's my story, and then of course you know that I eventually developed type two diabetes and and reversed it on a low carb diet. And I, what but motivates me? How still, how heavy did you ever get? What was your heaviest weight? I was about I, I was about one hundred and one kilos, and I'm now about eighty five. But I went down to about eighty one. But then I went back and did more weight training, and I put on four kilos of muscle. So that's that's where I am at the moment. But my weight when I was rowing competitively in the in when I was 20 was 81 kilos. So 81 was my ideal. Um, so I'm about 84, but it, which isn't bad at 74, because I don't think much of it's fat. I think there's a 
there's more muscle. I'm more muscular than I was actually at, at 21 rowing. And how tall are you? How tall, how tall are you? I'm, I'm six foot two. Okay, so, so 100 kilos is 220 pounds, which yeah. two, here's the interesting thing. You are never, ever obese. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the concepts that we put out there is that when you become diabetic early, your insulin production is fairly low, so you tend to become hyperglycemic because you can't be hyperinsulinemic, and you require insulin to turn the sugar into fat. So some of our folks are become enormous without becoming diabetic, and yeah. other people like you. So I don't, I'm not certain, and let's see if you agree or disagree with me. I'm not certain that your lack of obesity was as much related to your athleticism as it was related to the fact that you couldn't produce adequate insulin. So okay, so I, I, I like your theory. Prevented you from becoming heavy rather than the fact you were burning off all the calories. Yeah, so there, I think you that's a very important point. So I've reached the stage now in our research, and I'm not, I think you've heard me speak about this, that the reason you burn carbohydrate is purely to regulate your blood glucose. That's why you burn carbohydrates. And that's why humans burn so much carbohydrate at rest. And the more obese you are, the more carbohydrate you're burning. And to me, it's because they have great trouble regulating your glucose, the more obese you are. I do, however, have data on myself. When I was 28, my BMI was 21. I was running 120 kilometers a week and I was racing marathons. And I had an insulin, a fasting insulin when I was on a high carbohydrate diet, six times normal. Wow. So I was secreting a lot of insulin, but you're quite right. I was burning, I, I was burning off the carbohydrates. And I I mean, I, my best race was in 1973. Within a month, I'd put on about four kilos. Wow. And yeah, and that's that's how quickly it happened. I mean, it was just, and I could never understand it. So then I would have to go back and run because I couldn't run. I was tired. And then as soon as I went back and ran, I would get my weight down again. But that's why I ran so much mm. was to keep my my weight down. Right. But in those and, in the early days, um, you were still able to convert some of that high sugar into fat. As you said, you burned the calories. Yeah. In the later stages, when you became type 2 diabetic, you weren't able to get yeah. the sugar into the cells to be turned to fat. So yeah became hyperglycemic as part of your insulin resistance. There's always yeah, a problem. And we're hyperinsulinemic to the point we become hyperglycemic and we cross over. Yeah, exactly. And I wasn't eating much carbohydrate. I wasn't as, eating as much carbohydrate. Right, then. right. I mean, I was, I was eating much less. I was trying to starve and mm -hmm. I could, it didn't work, obviously, as we know. I, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't regulate my weight. I've got an interesting little quote that I'm, I'm going to be putting out on my social media in a little bit, but I, this pertains to this. In athletes, um, the difference between weight gain and muscle building is insulin resistance. Yeah. And and again, it's something to think about, but I've, I've looked at a lot of our athletes who are in insulin resistant, eating a lot of carbohydrates, and they gain weight very easily when they're not burning off the calories. Those That's that are just what I... insulin sensitive are bulking up. Uh, yeah. Than, rather than just gaining fat weight. So yeah. uh, where, where insulin is really affecting protein synthesis and, and that kind of thing, as opposed to trying to store excess sugar. So uh, yeah, that's it's really interesting that in your lifespan, and you've obviously researched this quite heavily, you've seen that. Uh, can I ask you this, though? What medications and supplements are you currently taking? I take metformin, and I measure my glucose every morning, and... What I've noticed is that my glucose control can be really good for about a month when I'm running at about fasting of 5.1 around about there. And in the evening, the glucose might be 5.4. And then suddenly it'll shift up to 5.6 in the morning and might be or 5.8 in the morning and might be 5.6 in the evening. So, I mean, it's a small difference, but it's clearly different. So I homeostatically regulate glucose differently. Do you think for, that I can keep it effect in the morning? Yeah. But but what I don't understand is how it can be like that for a month and then it goes back to normal again. And, and you're quite right, it could be stress. But the, sometimes I'm very stressed and my control is pretty good. So I'm, I don't know what's happening there. So I take metformin. If my glucose goes up, I double the dose. I go up to 
at two grams a day. Otherwise, I live on one gram a day. Yeah. What is your what is and, your and, sorry? What is your hemoglobin A1C? Yeah, it's usually 5.6, 5.7, which is but that's higher than my glucose. It's not so it's not correct. There's there's something wrong with that value. It should be lower than that because yeah. I've my glucose is not 5.6 all the time. Yeah. Right. So the interesting thing, and I think this is a, a very important point, is that a lot of people treating diabetes want to rush to get their patients off medication. Mm -hmm. And yet you've chosen to stay on medication, even though your diabetes, your blood sugar numbers are good. And, and that's a message that we try to convey to a lot of patients as well, is that the system to a certain extent is broken. And don't be in a rush to come off the medication and don't be in too much of a rush to lower your medication uh, just because you're on a ketogenic diet. Follow the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, well, I, I think that, you know, the risk probably for a fasting glucose, it kind of goes, it's kind of exponential and I'm probably way down on the bottom. But uh, the point was I had 60 odd years of high glucose or oh, sorry not high glucose high insulin mm -hmm. and so i've just wanted to <laughs> keep the risk as low as possible have you rechecked your insulin level again your c peptide your insulin level yeah and it's down about two or three it's you know it's now very low right uh, but you, you might say that's uh, type 2 diabetes with insulin failure but i you know I, that i haven't checked a glucose tolerance test in the last five years or so. And the phrase that we use is, is uh, that I've created is insulin suppression that we see in uh, some of our carnivores where they're so they're in such deep ketosis, they're not able to utilize or burn their, their sugar. And the interesting thing there, Prof, uh, and I didn't want to go down here because I've got so many other questions I want to ask you is um, that one of the, and, and let's go, let's go across to this. Um, one of the interesting things about physiology and, and, the, the the characteristics of science right now is that the difference between an association and a cause. And one mm -hmm. of the associations that we've always believed in is that elevated blood sugar triggers the release of insulin. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting in my carnival population who are somewhat insulin suppressed, the insulins are super low um, because they're not eating carbohydrates and they're in deep ketosis, is that when they eat um, uh, lean meat, and their sugar goes up, their blood sugar goes up three, four hours after they've eaten, they do not get an insulin response. Mm. Even though their blood sugar is high. We also see in the hospital when I infuse insulin as dextrose into patients, mm. they don't get an insulin response. So mm. the interesting thing is I, I've changed my thinking about what triggers insulin release. And I believe that it is more likely GLP-1, the incretin, mm. that triggers the insulin release. There's a small bump from hyperglycemia, yeah. the bigger bump, almost like the penny, far penny farthing front wheel is GLP-1. So it requires oral ingestion of sugar to trigger that GLP-1. And mm -hmm. what we've done now with our carnivores is introduce just a small amount of sugar, for example, in the form of milk, twice a day to trigger that insulin response. And in those yeah, folks, yeah. The insulin a little higher and their blood sugars can come down a little bit. So the, the question that I have for you is, uh, let, let me just ask one other question just to finish the last topic. Do you take any other medications or supplements? I take plenty of supplements. I take virtually all the vitamins. And uh, I take like, I've got a, an array of bottles. <laughs> I take three a day, three bottles a day. So it's vitamin, all the vitamins plus magnesium plus uh, zinc. That That's kind of what I've stuck with. And uh, I, I you know, people do suggest you should take other things, but I, I, I take berberin occasionally. But I, I, and what's interesting is that I definitely notice if I stop taking them, my glucose control is not quite as good. But, you know, we're talking about 0.1 or 0 0.2 right. millimoles of glucose. So that's people wouldn't think that that was much change. And which statin are you on? Sorry? Which statin are you on? Because you're a diabetic. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Prof, let me get back. I appreciate you you sharing that. The um, the next the, the question really is. I mean, I first met you in physiology class, yes. and um, you spent your life your your university life pretty much as a physiologist. Yes. Define what physiology is and what the purpose of teaching and understanding physiology is. You might the reason why I am often outspoken 
<laughs> often outspoken is because I try to understand what's going on behind everything. And that's physiology. That's uh, to understand what happens, as you said, the GLP-1, et cetera. You know, what's that doing? What's glucose doing? What's free fatty acids doing? And uh, in fact, I, on my desk here and next to me, I'm going through all the most famous papers on metabolism, the ones that, and particularly during exercise. And what you do is you develop a model. So I've got my model. It's that your body is trying to burn all carbohydrate as quickly as possible. So that's the model. So now I must go through all these scientific papers and see, does that model fit? Does it explain all the other studies? If it doesn't, it's wrong. If it can explain all these studies, then it's right. And so far, it's standing up. It's holding very, very well. So that the physiology is to try to understand how the body works in its totality. And I think that's that's why, although I may be talking about glucose and free fatty acids, I was the first to say that the brain's regulating, not sorry, not the first, but the first modern person to say that the brain's regulating exercise performance because it was the only way you could explain all these findings. So, so what happens in physiology is that people become very focused in their area. I'm a glycogen person and they don't know anything else about anything else. And then they, and their whole career is just, I'm going to study glycogen. What impressed me, I was, I did serve on a committee that was selecting the most famous sports scientists and giving them a, an award. And we had a, a Nobel prize winner and he would say, this person, no, you can't consider him or her because they didn't move the field forward. They just did, they repeated the same experiment every day. And that, that's what the problem with science is. We're too scared to challenge our own beliefs and to do the experiment that will disprove it. And I think my career was always trying to disprove the th model that we developed. So in my understanding, physiology is the, it's a model of how the body interacts, all the hormones and everything react. And then that you gives you a model that you can test and hopefully test it by trying to disprove it. And that's what that's what I've done. And and in the last two, three years, we're the first people ever. I mean, this is how long have been physiologists have been around, exercise physiologists, since since 1920, wow. we had the capacity to study what people burn during exercise. 1920. No one had said, okay, if we put you on a high-fat diet and make you exercise vigorously, what are you burning? No one asked that question. And as soon as we did it, it just blew the field apart because we found that people can burn fat enormous, at enormous rates if they fat adapted and keep the insulin low. And that, that's probably the key. So that's the science. Science is, physiology is trying to understand how the body works in terms of its metabolism, the hormones, the brain, et cetera. I love the evangelism that you bring because that is your passion. But here's an interesting, the reason I asked that question, because that's how I grew up. I started in your classes. I started in biochemistry class. When I was in the lab in Toronto doing my PhD in the 1990s, there was a conscious decision by the university. In fact, the year after me, I was taken into a bench lab, a physiology biochemistry lab. And the year after me, they made a conscious decision to switch off bench work and switch on epidemiology. And mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. folks after me started doing epidemiology research. And one of the one of the things that I look at, when I think I believe that one of the biggest challenges to people's inability to recognize um, the physiology that you talk about so passionately is because it's been contaminated by epidemiology studies and mm -hmm. The, the the problem with assigning causation to association. Yeah, and yeah. I love because now when you go to talks, when you listen to physicians or doctors like even like yourself talking, very commonly we're presenting epidemiologic papers to justify our points of view rather than talking about physiology and biochemistry to justify mechanisms. So the majority of, let's say, the vegan, vegetarian, low-fat arguments are epidemiologic. But then when we use physiology, they can't compare. So they yeah. use uh, causation epidemiology to, as, a, as almost like a club to club physiology. But you can't change physiology. So could you speak a little bit about that? Because it's such a key point. And 
Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is the book, because I'm hoping that the book is physiology, not epidemiology. <laughs> yeah, that's we can tell you that definitely is the case. It's 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 mostly almost all of it is physiology rather than epidemiology. And that, that's a really great point that you make. So, yeah, causation. Um it's not something we teach and we don't understand relative risks and absolute risks. And uh, that's one of the huge problems. So doctors talk about risk, but they, they don't really explain to the patients what the 30% re risk reduction means, et cetera. So yeah, epidemiology is, has been a disaster and I'm really unhappy to hear you say that. It's really interesting you said that, but in our medical school, we, we removed physics from the medical curriculum. Now, physics is the basis of making you think and making you question, which is not what epidemiologists do. So once we remove physics, we also run into trouble. And I always love physics because, again, it was this is the way it is, and you, you can't argue with those, those equations. You had to learn the equations, but at least they they tended to be to be realistic so no the book is it's all about physiology and biochemistry uh, and we've got 140,000 words of references <laughs> that's so that the it's really got all the information and just to advertise again you know this is the first time people have put together this book on the low carb diet and it's clear the low carb diet is the most studied diet in the world. It's got more evidence for it than any other single diet. And I think that's what's going to come from when people read the book and they realize, my gosh, these guys did it. They put it all together. So, so Prof, first of all, I'm just going to uh, uh, ask you to something that I've had to do myself is stop using the word diet because a diet yeah. is intent. This is a way of yeah. life. It's a way of eating. Again, I, it's just a little thing, but uh, yeah. you get into trouble with that because one of the common things that people tell me, oh, but it's unsustainable. It's a, it goes, you know, and, and we know, and hopefully the book will articulate this, that that's not true. But let's step back a little bit. In terms of the book, can you tell us what it is, how it came to creation, who's uh, contributed, what is the backstory to the book? And uh, if I'm correct, we're talking about a book that's going to be published in, I think, March of next year, and it's correct. called so what is the full title of the book? Yes, um, <laughs> I've got all the details here and I have to remember what the title is um, and I'm not going to be able to find it immediately. So it's... it's Genics, I think, is the, is the yeah. starting word. Okay. That's correct. And it's about the low-carb diet. So how did this come about? What was the okay. purpose and how did you set it up? So it was at a meeting of our experts on the Noakes Foundation and Nutrition Network. And Neville Wellington, who was one of the first doctors in Cape Town to start doing the low-carb diet and promoting it, and he did it all because he worked out that he went on, on he was taught by the experts in Britain, and he suddenly said, but if the problem is glucose control, why do we feed people glucose? And so then he decided to read it. And at that time, I just exposed myself that I was changing my diet. And so we got together. And then Hasina came along, Hasina Karji, and the two, of, and we formed the Noakes Foundation, and we were the directors. And then one day, one of them, and I'm not sure if it was Hasina or Neville, said, you know, I, I, I think it was probably Hasina, and I can still actually see the meeting we had, and she said, you know, if we're going to make low carbs really acceptable, we have to have a textbook. And so she set up the idea and then the foundation and the nutrition network started working on it. And we can connected with all the people like yourself who have contributed to the nutrition network. And, and draw, we saw who would, would like to write and we invited them all to write. And then we found 62 authors from around the world. And they all gave their time and effort. Just for a second there, 62 authors. That is 62. a massive number of people throughout the world that are not only bought into this, but are somewhat experts or really, really uh, well-versed in the understanding of ketogenics. That's a massive number. Yeah, it is. And they are absolutely the leaders in the field. There may be one or two that we didn't get, 
But everyone we got well, is an absolute leader and recognized in their fields. So it was astonishing how how they responded and they just gave all their time and effort. So then the book, so then we, of course, asked them all to write and they agreed and then they started writing and then it went through a major editorial and checking. We had two or three editors who were ruthless in the way they went through the the manuscripts. I have gray hair from that. <laughs> That's right. But but so, I'll stop you again for a second and give a massive shout out to those unsung heroes that are the editors. I, I know I interacted with them over a long period of time and they were phenomenal in terms of quality control and reference control. And they cannot be underestimated in terms of the, the magnitude of work that they did on this. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to just want to put it out there because they you really depend on that quality control uh, when you produce a, a big controversial volume like this. And having experienced that myself with a couple of chapters that I produced uh, was absolutely incredible to see how fastidious they were. Yeah. And so that was that's fantastic. One of the the sadness is, is the book. We weren't allowed to put their names on the cover. But anyway, that's they'll be recognized. So that was that was amazing, and uh, again, it, it's the there are so many topics we we covered virtually all the possible topics. There are something like uh, eleven chapters, or oh, sorry, let me just check that. I think it's eight chapters, and they cover the whole body. That's uh, that's what it's. It really is encyclopedic in in its content. But can I and just as you've said, it's first, not epidemiology. This is this is the hard science. Right. For example, if you take the cancer, because cancer obviously, I'm just taking one example. We had the the people who really understand the disease, Thomas Safield, for example, Safried, and he goes into great detail about the mechanism by which cancer may be influenced by the diet. And he's gone, all the biochemistry is there in great detail and how this may be helped by low carb diet. And, and that applies to all the all the chapters. They are and the the detail is remarkable. So so prof, one of the one of the interesting things when you first and foremost trigger cancer, what the devil has cancer got to do with diet? I think one of the one of the insights that is normal for us, but the world looking at us doesn't understand is that, you know, a decade or two ago, the only value of a ketogenic diet was to lose weight. It was a diet. And people yeah. used it as one option of caloric, caloric reduction to reduce diet. Then we started to see the influence on diabetes. And I think what this book is going to show the world that still thinks of the ketogenic diet as a weight loss tool that yeah. fails because people don't stick to it. Um, yeah. it. It is pervasive in every aspect of human physiology and it influences metabolically every aspect of the human body. And the beauty about this book, we already know that on the inside, but, but helping people to understand that insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia has an impact on the full spectrum of all metabolic disease. And, and I think we so easily recognize that we don't realize that other people can't even see that. They, they're yeah. oblivious to it. And therefore, if they think of it as a calorie reducing diet and all this fat that we're eating must be bad for us, that level of ignorance is really fostering their inability to see what we see metabolically. Absolutely. And let's take another chapter on neurology. And the book has recently been written on brain energy. And it's be, it's one of the top books now currently on Amazon. And again, showing that proper diet can influence remarkably chronic neurological diseases and schizophrenia etc so so that's an, another area that people might not have thought about so so prof here's an interesting question do you think from a physiologic perspective the problem is the substrate sugar or is the disruption primarily caused by the hormonal ch changes the dis the hormonal dysregulation that comes from chronic excessive sugar consumption. Yeah, so I think that, that firstly, glucose by itself is highly toxic. And as you know that, and you know, it's really funny because 
it's amazing when you see something and you don't understand it, but we did many experiments where we infused high glucose concentrations into veins in athletes to get their blood glucose high. And then the, the patients would come back the next day and they would have the veins would be inflamed. And and we'd say, oh gosh, you know, so you'd think it's an infection. How did we get the infection there? But because we use a sterile technique. And we didn't think maybe it was the glucose that high glucose was damaging the arterial, the, the venous lining. So, so my point being that the body protects the blood glucose, it tries to get it down. And that's the first priority in human metabolism, keep the glucose low. So why does it do that? The problem is it secretes insulin and then maybe the insulin becomes, becomes highly toxic because the insulin response hangs around for a long time. It doesn't suddenly disappear which is something I didn't understand until I looked at it more carefully. You know, you think, well, you get a glucose spike, so you get an insulin spike. No, the, in, the insulin will stay up until that glucose has come down, and then it sort of sort of drops down a bit. So I'm not sure whether it's just the insulin or whether it's the glucose, but I would, my goal is to get the insulin down. So that's kind of, kind of my focus. And I think what's and, interesting for me is the, if you look at the physiology of insulin, the, the the degree to which insulin affects so many other non-glycemic components, for example, DNA synthesis, DNA replication, um, protein synthesis, the, the insulin is such a pervasively controlling hormone, steroid hormone production, that that's, where I, that's why I asked the question, is this prolonged hyperinsulinemia into the fasting phase? Uh, where you should see somewhat of a decline. And even after a prolonged phase, we, uh, your blood sugar may be normal, but your insulin is still high. Yeah, um, is, is it an insulin influence? And a lot of the collateral diseases that may not have a primary mm. connection with sugar, it may be the influence of not just insulin, but also glucagon when those two are dysregulated. There are influence in cellular mechanics and cellular physiology beyond the sugar. The sugar is the trigger, but it's not the sugar per se, it's the insulin that's causing that, that injury. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things, you know about the Randall cycle, I assume. Yes, very well. And um, I love the fact that you go back, way back in the history of, of literature. And one of the interesting things about the Randall cycle is, and, and it certainly is a, a truth that fat and, ins, fat and sugar get used variably in a cell. However, when Randall wrote that paper in 1963, Philip Randall wrote that paper in physiologic ignorance about a particular hormone. And so when I was reading, I, I, I read about the Randall cycle. I said, okay, this makes sense, but it's in isolation in a cell. There must be other influences. So I pulled yeah. the actual paper from 1963. And if you read it, um, it reads very much like the effects of glucagon. So why yeah. did he mention glucagon in the paper? There's one paragraph in his, one sentence in his discussion that says that they used a pancreatic emulsion in one of the experiments, but it didn't. Yeah. And the reason for that is because glucagon was only uh, isolated in pancreatic emulsions in 1959, and as a hormone was only isolated in 1976. So the Randall yeah. cycle was written before we even knew about glucagon. And yeah. we've got to take that into physiologic context. Same thing with GLP-1 now. So, yeah. you know, the influence is that, that's why I just love the physiology that you taught us because it allows you to think and add new information yeah. to the equation, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, the Randall effect absolutely doesn't happen in humans during exercise. It's all insulin. And insulin regulates free fatty acids. And then if you, and the cutoff, you know, it's really interesting because in some of the experiments we did in the 1990s, we got patients with the insulin dropping below six units. And when they do that, then their free fatty acids just shoot up. But if they go above six, you get an inhibition of free fatty acid use. And so you become a carbohydrate burner. So insulin to me is the absolute driver of what, you, what you're metabolizing during exercise. And it's not that fats inhibit glucose. Nonsense. What happens is during exercise, the body says, if you're carbohydrate loaded, I must burn glucose. I must get rid of glycogen. And, you know, we spent 20 years trying to slow down muscle glycogen use on the theory that if you had a little bit of muscle glycogen left, you could do that final sprint and win the, the marathon. 
And we could never find a method to do it. And <laughs> we infused glucose we, and we infused everything and we couldn't get any effect. And it's clear, as soon as you start exercise, you burn muscle glycogen very rapidly, depending on how intense the exercise is, but you burn it very rapidly. And it doesn't matter what you do, you can't stop it. You can put free fatty acids there. They have very little effect. It's the, the only way to do it is to get the insulin so low, and then you might get, get some inhibition. But this there's so clear that it's it's glucose is the chosen fuel because why? The body says, I'm being abused with all this carbohydrate. I must get rid of it as soon as possible. And so that the next time I eat, I will store the glucose in glycogen and I'll be better off. And I use that for my own type 2 diabetes management, that, that I have to have a longer run twice a week because that clears out my glycogen and then I can my glucose control is improved. And it's, it's remarkable how effective that is. Let me ask you a little uh, a question along exactly those lines, because I hear this a lot from the athletes and we're investigating this in our own practice in terms of appetite control and also getting people into ketosis. What do you think about ketone esters and ketone exogenous ketones for athletes? How does I, I heard exactly what you said now. How does the consumption of exogenous ketones uh, factor into the equation of altering fat mobilization, sugar. Is sugar still dominant, do you think? How does this work? Is it a myth? Is it a gimmick? Uh, is it real? What do exogenous ketone uh, ketone esters do for athletes? Okay, I think they're going to find that they're very beneficial for disease people and they're less effective for exercise. And I'll tell you why I think that. So behind you, you won't be able to see but I'm currently going through all the literature to explain why do carbohydrates allow athletes to, to exercise better. And it's very clear it's by preventing hypoglycemia. That's what it does. So if you have an experiment and if you want to prove that carbohydrates improve performance, you have to fast the athletes, get them to start with a low liver glycogen. And I can convince, I can absolutely certain that the group taking the glucose will do better because the placebo group will become hypoglycemic. And there's, you know, and and I saw one fabulous paper, which which now has become one of my key fake papers, where they fasted the guys and then they exercised them. But what they did was they allowed them to, to get lower, to, to continue pedaling, but to lower their exercise intensity. And you see that as soon as their glucose starts to fall, they reduce their exercise intensity until they're barely pedaling. Now the governor theory. Exactly right. And they they reduce, but now they reduce it to such a low intensity that they could burn fat. They should be able to burn fat and exercise. And that and they missed it. They their key was they missed that point. Because they're saying, oh, you see, you've got to do carbohydrate oxidation, but there comes a point at which fat will burn, you can burn fat and you, and you'll be fine. Are you talking about fatty acids as opposed to ketones? Or are you talking yeah. about so I'm not, I'm not sure I, it's mainly free fatty acids. So, sorry, my point is that hypoglycemia is the number one driver of your impaired performance. And that happens. And then there's another phase where if you correct the hypoglycemia, then people get still get tired and their glucose is normal and they, they're out of, out of glycogen, but it's not glycogen that's stopping them. There's something else that's stopping them. And so... I don't see how ketones are going to prevent the early hypoglycemia. Maybe they would allow the brain to use something else, the ketones. That might be a way, but I, I'd, I'd like to see that evidence. And and But the way you would test that is to have guys fasting and then for 16 hours and then give them ketones and see what happens to their blood glucose and how their performance is altered. Well, in fact, in fact, it's interesting. That's just a little ad hoc. Uh, we don't, we're not doing this under laboratory experimental conditions. But for several of our athletes, we are using this ketone. It's a ketone ester that's rapidly available. It doesn't matter about the brand. This is the one that for us is most palatable, which is a problem, palatable. Yeah. And then also it gets the ketones up fairly high. Very and quickly. Yeah. Found in our fasted athletes uh, who are overnight fasted, about fourteen to sixteen hours, and they're exercising before they first eat they are seeing a bump both in terms of strength and endurance 
when they add uh, a decent amount of ketone ester. And I, I, I agree with you that the hypoglycemia is the issue. The question though is, do the ketones offer a an alternative to, to reduce the flux of glucose out of the bloodstream? In other words, does it delay hypoglycemia? Um, because you've got now two fuel sources, yeah. especially for the brain. Because as you so rightly pointed out, it's rarely the muscle that runs out of glycogen, because that's called rigor mortis. And yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, exactly. last time we spoke. So um, yeah. it really is, as you said, the, the brain hypoglycemia and whether the ketones temporize that or reduce the rate at which those those gluco that glucose yeah. does go low. I don't know, but uh, we are seeing a anecdotal beneficial effect in those athletes that are using this in the fasting state. What I must say that I went to the company who makes that product. I think that's the San Francisco group. It is, yes, yeah. And, and they gave me some, Brianna Stubbs gave me some, and my glucose dropped like this, because I was, my glucose wasn't so well controlled that day. Right. And the ketones went up to five, three very quickly within yeah. half an hour, and my yeah, glucose we, came down. 5.5 five, 5 sometimes, we've seen yeah. this seven, uh, taking yeah. this, and it's not a huge amount, um, but it, it that's why we looked at this one because of the ketone esters, they're a bit slower to PQ. Yeah. This one gets that that, uh, and Brianna's done some good work on. She's published quite a, some really good studies um, on the use of these ketones. Um, but but it's I think uh, I think they will they will work centrally if they work. And I told Brianna this. I said if they work, they'll work centrally. I don't think that they it's going to work in the periphery. I don't think that's that's where the main effect will be. Well, you know what's interesting, Prof, is I use these not for athletic performance because a vigorous game of chess is uh, heavy <laughs> exercise for me. Yeah. But uh, I use these for appetite suppression. And I think yeah. it's a similar principle in that I don't need to consume glucose as my I run out of sugar because of that. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, these are just, this all just extends from the book because I, I think the, that the we've got to look at who's going to read it. A lot of people in our group are going to read it, but the ideal is for other people who are skeptical of yeah. ketones or think that the, a keto diet is just another one of the thousands of different diets people can use for weight loss. Really, the physiology and the science behind this, rather than the epidemiology, is so important. Uh, yeah. And I'm I'm very excited that this is a physiologic tome because it, you know when you come, especially in the statin, the lipid group and everyone's interested in the lipids, um, you look at the epidemiologic statistics and we can argue those back and forth. But ultimately, if you understand the epidemiology of lipid metabolism, then the lipid heart hypothesis makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. And it also makes statins uh, meaningless in terms of what they're intended to do. But unless you understand that physiology and can understand it autonomously, in other words, independent of bias, you're not going to have that information at hand. Well, David Diamond, who's the great one on statins, wrote our chapter on statins in the cardiovascular disease section. So, so that that we have all that information, absolutely correct. And then, yeah. so, to go ahead. So that so just to show that's the type of uh, the quality of the people who are writing. We got the people who are absolutely up to date writing for us. And just one, uh, not directly in the book, although it will appear in the book, is uh, we just the other day had, I participated in an addiction session. What are your thoughts about the psychology of uh, carbohydrates in the modern era? And I know you're you're heavily involved in the physiology of, of, of sport and of, of exercise, but there is that component as well. And you refer to yourself where you've had that epiphany that that was a problem for you as well. I noticed that Nutrition Network has now added this to their uh, curriculum. Uh, it really is lovely to see that come of age. I spoke about this in the conference that you held in Cape Town a decade right. ago. Yeah. <laughs> I was blown off the stage. Oh, you're wrong, you're wrong. And now, yeah. what are your thoughts in terms of articulating this and making this a more important concept for, the, for people to understand out there, as opposed to just diet and carbohydrate as an energy yeah. I think it's really important, and you're quite correct. You were ahead of us by a long way. And what the Nutrition Network and the Dokes Foundation has committed itself is to promoting the idea that obesity is strongly influenced by food addictions and sugar addiction. And that until you sort out the food addiction and the sugar addiction, you won't reverse the obesity, you won't reverse the type 2 diabetes. 
and we've made that we've put a we put our stake in the ground and said that any policy you have a national policy for food you have to address food addiction if you want to reverse type 2 diabetes if you want to re reverse obesity so we absolutely agree with you that that's absolutely crucial. And until people understand that, and that's why we can't reverse the type 2 diabetes obesity pandemic, because the industry is, is ahead of us and they, they're they not going to change. So, Prof, uh, um, this is just a fabulous, fabulous book. You've brought together 62 people to write this book chapter from all over the world. One of the things that I am concerned about in this space, I think we are we are maturing very rapidly in the ketogenic space but the the issue that i still see is a variety of different fractured factions you've got different people trying to monetize the space you've got people mm -hmm. trying to share the word in a variety of different things and what we're lacking is adequate cohesive leadership i think as the editor of this book the leadership that you've shown to bring 62 people in to contribute um, because of their passion toward the, su the subject and their expertise in it to contribute these book chapters to this book. You brought 62 people together in a book. But as I look at this, we are fractured across the world in terms of our representation. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I believe we need in the space is a very a strong leadership to bring us all together, not just in a book, but in a cohesive space. And Adele Haidt was very, very good about saying, it's not about our differences. We're always going to have differences, mm -hmm. but it's about our collectivism and what the, what the overarching consensus is. I, one of the, I don't know of anybody out there who has the leadership ability that you do. Nobody, except for those people in the dietary space, will ever, and I don't think they're ever going to make that mistake again, <laughs> question your science. But your leadership in the space, and the reality is this, we no longer have to defend what we're doing. We have yeah. to broaden other people's insight into what we're doing. It is no longer a, you're no longer on trial. You won both of those. So expanding and, and putting ourselves out there, and the way I look at it is a lot of sand, doesn't make a lot of noise when you drop it, but a rock makes a lot of noise. And to help to get us to stand together, you know, we formulated uh, originally the a few years ago, we formulated something called the SMHP, which was designed to be that umbrella organization. The challenge is that we've got great people on there, but we don't have that Mandela person to bring the country together, if that makes sense. And I was wondering whether you would potentially, and I'm asking this in my own personal capacity, not anything else, but yeah. consider that the time has come for cohesive leadership. We can still have our own little spheres in that, but to have an umbrella leadership where everybody is within that umbrella organization. And as I said, we've, we've tried to initiate that, but it's been seen as a faction. Would you ever consider taking on that leadership mantle uh, because there's nobody out there in this space that doesn't respect you as much as I respect you. And <laughs> and everybody shares the same respect for you. Um, what do you think about, about leadership and, and your role in that, together with the launching of this book? Yeah, well, I'm very flattered that you should say all those kind things. You know, if people ask me, I'll certainly consider it and do it. Um, obviously, I'm not 20 years old anymore. <laughs> and, and I have other equal priorities but uh, if it's if it's considered to be necessary and if the right people are involved yes we must do we must take it forward yeah so definitely i would be very happy to and i hope you'd be strongly involved in it as well i i am involved from more a a, a person in the trenches and that's why i'm asking this question i'm, I'm so pleased that that this is a, a way of thinking because that cohesiveness is so important. If you look at mm -hmm. every other um, of age, uh, uh, medical specialties that have come of age, I look at this, at, at us being metabolic doctors who treat mm -hmm. metabolic disease, whether it is PCOS, whether it is 
uh, diabetes, whether it's obesity, because we have a communal understanding of the influence mm -hmm. of the metabolic impact. So the gynecologist who treats PCOS, it's a fraction of their practice. The endocrinologist that treats diabetes, but we don't have a specialist that does this. And both in the lay community, as well as in the medical community, we've come of age where we should be beginning to organize as a specialty in yeah. our practice. But we don't have the bricks and mortar we have people like me who ad hoc do things, and I, you know, my whole practice is geared toward this. But we don't mm -hmm. have the scientists involved; they've stayed away from it. We ha we have some clinicians involved, but I think creating us as a specialty with science, with basic science, with epidemiologic science, as much as we talked about that, with clinical practice as an entity, and we need the leadership of someone like yourself to bring that together as a cohesive force. Starting with this book, because that's what this book does. Yeah, it brings exactly. David Diamond, who is a non-MD uh, uh, scientist, together with me, who's mostly a practicing MD and other folks, all together in the same group. And we have that opportunity. So uh, we will talk some more about that if you're if you're amenable to it. I, I understand. Definitely. But Definitely. I would love to expand that. I've actually spoken to Neville about the bricks and mortar side as well, because the time has come. The time yeah, yeah. has come for us to, for someone to be able to walk into an office and say, I'm here to treat my, or to get advice about my cancer, not cancer therapy, but how do I manage my diet in terms of the cancer? How do I manage this in terms of my neurology? I'm schizophrenic, how do I treat this? And we've got to have people with the knowledge that can walk into that space with the science. Yeah, well, I'm not scared because, you know, I really was very influential, influential in starting sports medicine in South Africa, and that's now become a speciality. So I understand the process and how it can be done. And so that would be the next goal. Yeah, That's the next goal. You've a phenomenal job of, of that. So I, I, so where where do we go from here? Uh, the, the textbook is going to be, in my opinion, a synergistic leap forward from mm -hmm. some lay thing that's done in the dark shadows of the internet toward being a robust, visible, un inarguable, Tome because of the science, because of the mm -hmm. physiology, because of the biochemistry, and because of the pathophysiology. Where do we go from there? That's a platform. Where do you think we should go from here? So what we did with sports medicine was that we trained a lot of people. And then eventually it was realized that there was more knowledge in sports medicine than there was in many of the other disciplines. And the so the people were actually practicing sports medicine, calling themselves sports physicians. And ultimately, it became obvious that there, this was a discipline. I think we need to go and speak to the authorities, the medical authorities, and say this, we believe that this is a speciality. How do we take it further? You know, I'm not sure... Every country is different. And sports medicine was recognized in, I think, in Germany long before other countries in Canada, particularly. I don't know what North, what North America, what the case was in North America. But it's probably different in different countries. And so we just have to start pushing. And we could look at what could happen in South Africa. So you need to come and see us in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there in, in January for a while and I'll come and visit with you then. That, that's, we absolutely need that. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I absolutely, you know, it's always so invigorating for me for, from so many different perspectives to have this conversation with you. Your humility and your leadership from behind, instead of being that rah rah person up front, you're always in the background. And whenever you speak, it, it is always poignant. It is always uh, a, a an astounding statement that you make. Even the one-liners that you send to our little group is like, wow. Uh, so <laughs> I so much appreciate the opportunity to do this, Prof, and also for you to share some of your personal insights about how you live your own life and what's influenced you, because so much of that will influence other people. Um, and I, I so appreciate this. And can you tell us just finally, uh, on the exit side, when is the book going to be available? Where is it going to be? How do? Because I've already had those questions. Where? Yeah. How do people access this? Well, Elsevier is the people they're publishing it, and we've already had an extraordinary response. They've never had as big a response ordering pre-publication. They're quite astounded by the interest. 
So probably if you went to the Nutrition Network or the Noakes Foundation, that would be the place to get some information. So Candice or or the other people who work with Candice might be able to help us there. But I think probably Nutrition Network is the, the place to look for con connections to Elsevier. So yeah. we can start, it, it is available for pre-order? Yes, absolutely it is, yes. And then where are the proceeds of the book going to go to? What What is the, where does the, not that, not that that's going to, yeah. it's anybody positive or negative, but where are the proceeds going to? I think to the Nutrition Network, because we've spent an inordinate amount of money. We've probably spent a million rand at least on getting this done. And it's kind of, you know, it's, that's a lot of money for our small organization. So I think we, the, most of the proceeds will go to correcting that, to, to correcting that deficit on our budgets, but thereafter the money will be invested in the Eat Better South Africa campaign and the work of the Nutrition Network. So it will all go back into the system. And Prof, for those that don't know, can you tell us just in a short couple of one-liners, what is Nutrition Network? What is Eat Better South Africa? What is the mission? Okay, so the Noakes Foundation was formed after we'd written the book, The Real Meal Revolution. I got a million rand because it sold so well. And, I, and then people said, well, you should start a foundation, which we did. I donated the money to the foundation. And very soon people said, yeah, but that book you've written is for the wealthy people in, Cape, in South Africa. What about the poor people? So we started the Eat Better South Africa campaign, focusing on the, getting the best possible diet for the people who don't have all the money that perhaps we have. So that's been the Eat Better South Africa campaign, and it's really taken off. We've got the most brilliant, brilliant manager of the organization, and she has just turned it all around. And there's growing, growing interest. The problem is that, pol that politicians and governments don't want to promote this diet even though we know it's that we prove that it it works also for people in fact probably even better for people who've got this dreadful diet because it's all glucose and all sugar diets so we've done some really good research showing that it's very valuable so that is eat better south africa is taking the ideal nutrition to to people who have restrictions on what they can afford and we show them that you can still eat a lot better than than what they would normally eat. The Nutrition Network started a complete chance because the, the team realized if we were going to make a difference, we had to train doctors and globally. So we started an, on online courses and it's just grown dramatically over the last four years. And I think we've trained something like 6,000 individuals, physicians and others in the how to prescribe the low, the low carb diet in all these different conditions. And we realized that we were teaching so much with that's why we needed a textbook as well. So the nutrition network, the focus is to get the message out to, to the doctors, the, the nurses and everyone else in this field and dietitians and provide that evidence because we think that if they, a doctor changes so many lives. So every doctor that we change will change many, many lives. So that's been the focus of the Nutrition Network, and it's been an astonishing success. And some people say it's the leading educator in this field I, in the world. Not some people say it is, period. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, yeah. and most of the authors of the book are uh, lecturers are in the course itself. So they would that's expect all the book chapters in this uh, in this thing. So yeah. absolutely fabulous. I mean, it really is. And, and one last question. Is the book... Uh, reasonable for lay people who have no medical knowledge or is this just for doctors and scientists no there are some chapters which you'll really enjoy so i, I read a couple on uh, the human diet understanding the human diet that with ben mickey bendor who's just an absolute giant i also read a chapter on cancer as a modern disease and then there's another one on how the dietary guidelines were abused and how they came about so no there is definitely scope for other for 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 the lay person to benefit from this book well prof i i so thank you and and this is just an incredible leap forward in terms of what we've done and again demonstrative of your of your leadership in bringing this group of people together to contribute to this so i i am excited i haven't actually seen the book i i know what i wrote but i haven't even seen the book <laughs> myself and as soon as a copy is available please send it our way but Thank Absolutely. you so much for your time today. And I really, really appreciate this. And we will get together in the early new year, I hope. I'll let you know. Please, Robert. I look forward to that.
Until Great. then, stay well. And thank you so thank much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Robert.